Good morning. We are back to our Kingdom Come series, and I'm going to begin a, a set of four messages that were meant to happen in November. But in light of what we've been through as a church family, I thought we would launch into them this week. And uh, we're going to think of them along the line of this theme, and I am frozen. Let's try this again. We're going to talk about kingdom kinship. I didn't realize that Godfrey was going to speak on this theme as he introduced communion this morning. But if you have a Bible, I hope you have a Bible or a device, and please open to Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to look at two verses that will help us think about what it means to live in relationship here in the church and in the kingdom of God. Uh, it's a huge aspect of scriptural teaching for us. The way that we relate to other people, to the church family, to the world around us, is a crucial aspect of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Much of the New Testament is instruction for us about how we live together with other people. And so here are the messages that we're going to be looking at uh, in the next four weeks. Today we're going to think about relational resilience. Next week we're going to talk about anger. And then we're going to talk about reconciliation and then we'll finish up on November 10th with forgiveness. I created this uh, word diagram to describe what many of us have felt and experienced in our relationships with other people. There's nobody in this room who has been unscathed by the relationships that you have had in your life. All of us have experienced these things. Uh, many of us, if not all of us, have committed some of these things, some of the sins that are listed here, uh, some of the unhealthy ways of relating to others. We have done these things, and we have experienced these things. A huge grief for me as someone who's been in ministry for most of my adult life is to witness again and again the way that Christian relationships break down. I know of far too many people, uh, thinking back to the COVID years, who because of whatever happened during COVID or whatever their view was or somebody else's view, professing Christians who just quit church to this day. They're, they're not here. And they just couldn't take what happened. And to this day, they haven't forgiven and they haven't made it right and they haven't sorted that out. And they're just living in this state of relational dishealth. It's just so important for us to see what God teaches in this area. And I want us to see what Paul teaches the Colossian Christians. Here in this book of Colossians, Paul is writing to believers that he'd never met. He'd only heard about this church. Others had been there, shared the gospel, people had been saved, a church had begun, and Paul has heard about this church. He's heard really good things about this church, and he's encouraging them about that. He's also heard about some false teaching uh, that is attempting to infiltrate this church, and he's warning them about that. But in both cases, the thing that he's emphasizing in Colossians is Jesus. And he wants them to see how great and awesome Jesus is, and we're going to see that in these two little verses as well. But here he is instructing these new Christians as a kind of pastor, concerned for their souls, for their well-being. Look at what he says in verse 12, Colossians 3, 12. Therefore, he says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's a short passage. Can I read it again for us? Ask God to minister these words to your own heart. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Relationships work in two directions. One is, it's the direction that comes from me to you. It's, 
It's the way that I live towards you in relationship. It's my behavior, my attitude, my conversation with you. That's one direction. The other direction is the way you relate to me and what I receive from you and what the things that you say to me and, the, and your attitude towards me. And then it's the way that I receive that. And whether I accept it or not, relationships move in these two directions. Uh, there's three things that our passage shows us that are absolutely crucial for relational resilience. Number one is our identity. Number two is our attitude, and number three is our behavior. Uh, many of us would be inclined to jump to number three and think that, well, when it comes to having healthy relationships, it's all about how we behave toward one another, and of course, that's really important. But here, Paul is showing us that the first two are crucial. In fact, one of the reasons we don't get to number three or we don't do number three well, we just don't behave well, is because we don't properly understand our identity as followers of Jesus. And we haven't proper, pro properly absorbed or received the transformation of our character and our attitudes that God intends for us to have as his people. So let's look at these strings, th three things, and we'll begin with identity, the three things that are mentioned here in verse 12. Maybe you notice them. And he's describing the Colossian believers here. Three things. First, he says, as God's chosen people. Then he calls them holy. And then he calls them dearly loved. Three things. Uh, here's, a, here's an easier way to remember them. Chosen, changed, and cherished. If we're going to have healthy relationships with other believers, Paul's saying, you need to understand this about yourself. Your identity and your understanding of your identity is so crucial. The word uh, chosen here refers to verse 12, as God's chosen people, or uh, more simply, Paul just wrote as the elect this is a theological term that we've argued about for centuries, but it simply means what it says. It means that God chose you. If you're a follower of Jesus here today, if you're a trusting in Jesus Christ, if you've repented of your sins, if you've been born again, why is that? Is it because you're really smart? You figured life out? You, you, you understood what the meaning of life was? You found God? Or was it that God found you? And theologically speaking, what Scripture helps us understand is that if you're a follower of Christ, understand this, it's not because you chose God, although you did, but it's first because God chose you. And Scripture would teach that even before the foundation of the earth, God already saw you. He already had his eye on you. It's like God was looking through the centuries and he saw this orphanage with a, a bunch of dirty, messy, snotty-nosed kids and through all the centuries, he, he saw into that orphanage and he saw, he saw you. And before the foundation of the earth, he chose you to be his child. That is the teaching of Scripture. That is what election means. Some people say, well, it's because God looked ahead and knew that I would chose, choose him. Well, I suppose that's true, but that's not the meaning of, of this terminology. God in his sovereignty before you ever knew him, before you were even alive. And remember here, God has chosen you knowing what you would be and what you would do. How many of us struggle in our relationship with God and we think, how could God love me in spite of all that I've done? Well, he did. He chose you knowing all that you would do and all that you have done. This is so important for our identity. We are chosen by God. Then he says, you're holy. Sometimes the English versions of the Bible call us here in this word, we are saints. It means that we have been set apart. And of course, Scripture says that God is holy. It makes sense when we think of God being set apart. What we mean by that is that he is different than everything else and everyone else. He's not like us. He's sinless. He's perfection. He is holy. How can it be that God calls us? Yeah, I, I, me and you. In spite of all of our ongoing weaknesses and failures 
And yet now in Christ, as believers, he says, no, you are holy, present tense. You are the holy ones. And it's because we have moved in our position from sinners who are separated from God, placed now into the righteousness of Jesus, into the very family of God. He has made us like Christ, given us the very righteousness of Christ. And so because of our standing, he can call us holy. It's not because we've been perfected yet, but our standing before God is one of holiness. Now, of course, when God changes our standing, his intention would be that our behavior, our character would begin to be transformed, and Scripture teaches that as well. We are the holy ones because God has made us holy, but also because he is making us holy. He's transforming us into holiness. I wonder how much we lean into that. Are, are we Are we participating with God in this transforming work that he's doing as he has made us holy but is still making us holy? And then, of course, we find out here that we are cherished, dearly loved, Paul writes. God loves you. Why is this important, by the way, when it comes to our relationships? What are the major hang-ups? What are the things that we struggle with that cause us then to struggle in relationships. I'll give you two. This is simplified, but two that I can think of right off the top. The first major problem we have in our relationships is that we have pride. And isn't that why we look down on other people? Isn't that why we judge other people? Because we think, I, I've got this. Like, if everyone could just be like me, life would be so much better. And we can't put up with people who aren't like us, and why can't you see it my way? And at the root of all of that is a pride that thinks I'm right and you're wrong and I'm better than you. And so we struggle in relationship because of that. Or in our communication. Have you ever tried to have a conversation with someone and they can't stop talking about themselves? Like that gets old for me really quick. And it's not like I want to talk about myself, but let's have a conversation here. Let's talk about life together. But here's a person who just can't stop telling you about them. It's hard to have a relationship with a person like that. That's, that's a pride issue. Think about how these three things address that. I mean, God intends for us to be amazed when we think about the fact that we are chosen. It's meant to bring security to us, and it's meant to bring worship how could God choose me? And it should humble us to realize that in spite of myself, God chose me. It should humble me to realize that in spite of myself, God is, has made and is making me holy. How could that be? Uh, Mark at Wayne's funeral this week talked about how he, he is the worst sinner he's ever met. How is that? It's because he knows his own sin better than he knows yours and mine. And that is so important for us to be humbled for God. It's before God. It's one of the reasons we do communion. To be reminded again and again that God saved me. God chose me. God is making me holy. And then God loves me. I am dearly loved and cherished by God. It is meant to be a pride melting, a pride destroying truth that would transform our lives and make us healthier in our relationships. Pride is one of the major uh, roadblocks in our relationships. Another one is fear, or call it insecurity. Uh, many of us struggle with shyness. Sometimes shyness is rooted, sometimes I know it's personality, but, but a lot of times it's rooted in fear, that I'm afraid for you to see the real me. I, I'm, I'm afraid to get too close to you and I might say something wrong or I might do something that you think is stupid. You might laugh at me. How many of us, there's very few people, even people who are strong and sure of themselves have experienced this kind of fear in relationship. Do you see how these three things provi provide the kind of security? I was thinking about how as a kid, and just full disclosure here, I had one of those security blankets. I mean, I was a kid. I, it had the, uh, the silk edge. Anyone remember this back in the 70s? It had the silk edge. So it was my favorite thing to kind of wrap up in this, and then it would rub the silk edge on my lip, on my face. <laughs> See, this is full. This is what relationship is all about. I'm telling you the real me. 
Sometimes these spiritual truths are meant to be like that, that we would literally wrap ourselves in the security of who God is and what He's done for us. And once we have done that and we find ourselves secure in Christ, it is much easier for us to have healthy relationships. I don't have to be afraid of you because I am secure in Christ. I don't have to be afraid to let you see the real me because I'm secure in Christ. These truths about our identity crush those, uh, those relationship hindrances of pride and fear. We need to understand who we are in Christ. Now, this is important, and it's interesting how Paul reminds the Colossians about who they actually are. They are God's chosen people, and one of the reasons he's doing this is this. Because of who you truly are in God's kingdom, you should relate well to others. That's part of what he's saying here. Hey, you belong to the kingdom of God. You are citizens of the kingdom of God. Therefore, this is how you should behave towards other people. But there's another way of looking at it, and it's this. Because of who you truly are in God's kingdom, you can relate well to other people. You see, we need those truths to be true in order for us to have healthy relationships, and here's the good news, they are true. And because of what God has done for you and in you, and he's brought you into this kingdom of his, he's made you a citizen of heaven, therefore, here is how we should relate to one another. That's identity. The second piece is attitude. I'm thinking here of character, I'm thinking here of what is our attitude towards others and ourselves? And I'm kind of picking two, of the, two out of the list that we find here in verses 12 and 13. Notice he says here we should be clothing ourselves. This is how you should dress as a Christian. Here are your spiritual clothes. And what does he say? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. And then he says bear with each other. And then he says, forgive one another. So I'm going to break all of these things down into two parts. The first one I'm going to call attitude, and then the second one I'm going to call behavior. If you think about it, some of these things uh, run a little bit deeper. So for example, the first one he mentions, that we should clothe ourselves with compassion. Does anyone have an old King James version here this morning? Anybody? Don't be ashamed. There's one over there. So I, I don't know exactly what it says, but it might say something like bowels of mercy. Does that look right over there? Maybe, yeah? I think that's what it says in the King James Version. So you know, on Valentine's Day, when we give a valentine to someone, we have the heart shape, and, and we, we use the heart as the seat of emotions in our culture, but in Bible times, it was the gut, the intestines. That's how you really knew if you loved someone, you felt it down, down a little lower than in the heart. And so that was the language that they used, bowels of mercy. And it's, it's this, that's why it's, trans, it's not translated wrong now for us when it says compassion, but understand what it's meaning here. It's saying that we should have this attitude towards other people, particularly towards other believers, a deep love a compassion that runs way beyond the surface. It's way more than a smile and a handshake and how are you, do, how are you doing? It's a deep-seated care and concern for other people. You say, well, that's my problem right there. I don't have that. And so I get my behavior wrong or maybe other people get their behavior wrong, presumably because they don't have that. And this is why I'm saying this is a deeper thing. This is a character thing, an attitude thing. How do we clothe ourselves with this? I've been wrestling this in my, in my own life even this week and being reminded again that when it comes to having deep compassion for people in certain circumstances, I come up short. And I look into my heart and I feel like I don't, I don't feel towards this person the way that I ought to feel. And then I'm reminded that this whole thing, this whole Christian thing, this whole salvation thing is a supernatural transformation that only God can produce in me. 
It's the reason that I needed to be saved in the first place. Uh, Scripture says that I fall short of the glory of God. Yeah, the glory of His compassion. I fall short of that, and therefore I was a sinner who needed a Savior, and praise God, He has saved me, but now I'm finding that I need that transforming work. It's a deeper thing. It's, It's a heart thing. He says that we should have compassion toward one another. Let me pull out another one. It's the word humility. Compassion, kindness, and then humility. We've talked about pride already. Where does humility come from? And how do we get our hearts transformed to see ourselves in the right way? You see, sin has us sitting on thrones. That's what we do in sin. We rise up in rebellion against God. We think, we think we're better than God. We think we know better than God. We're going to do it our way. We think we're better than other people. That's pride. But to relate well to other people, I need to be low. I need to have a humility. And it's got to be deep from within that I'm not just playing this. And I, I've played that game where you, where you act humble towards someone that you actually think you're way better than. But to, from deep within to have this idea that that when I see you, I see an object of, of my love and I see an, a, a person that I want to serve. Like genuinely, I want to lower myself. I want to take a lower rank. That's what humility is all about. You rank higher than me. Let me serve you. And Paul's describing here something that's real. Not some, not, we're not playing here. We're not acting. But it's actually become true in our hearts that we love each other from the gut with deep compassion, we humble ourselves before one another. And how does this happen? Well, we've already seen that it only happens through the supernatural work of God. It comes through salvation. When those first three things are there, because of my identity, these things can be true. Because He chose me before the foundation of the, of the earth. Because He's made me holy through Christ, through salvation It's only because of that that these things can be true of me, and as we know, it's a process. But isn't it interesting how God, or how Paul writes to us here in God's Word and says, put on these things. Now, somebody shared this morning, I won't mention names, but how they once showed up at church and someone said, "Uh, you dressed yourself today, didn't you? (laughs) And uh, this person confessed that since that moment, uh, they've allowed their wife always to lay out their clothes, which I also did this morning. Isn't it amazing with clothing how someone that you kind of can relate to and you've known them and yeah, you, you know, you kind of know them as, as a certain person, but when they dress up, whoa, I've never seen you in that light before. And dressing up is what, it's the language Paul is using here. And it shows us that there is a personal responsibility that we have to actually do these things to choose these things, even as God is transforming us, we understand that, but there's a choice involved, just like when I go to the closet this morning and decide which shirt it's going to be, there's a choice involved here, that we choose this for ourselves, we choose to behave in this way, we choose these attitudes, compassion and humility. Now, the other things in the list, I would say, are going to flow from here. These ones are the, are the deeper things, the things that are more in our heart. And the last things that we're going to find on the list, are, I'm going to call these behaviors, five of them. Kindness, you see them again there in verse 12. Uh, gentleness, or your version might say meekness. Patience, bearing with others, and forgiveness. These are the behaviors that we need to bring to our relationships with other people. Kindness, gentleness, patience, bearing with others, and forgiveness. There is a posture, a kind of behavior that we are taught here to have. We are commanded to have these things toward one another. And notice how these things uh, are, are a movement. In fact, sometimes when I think about God's love for me, I think about a river that flows relentlessly. Like if I went and stood out in the Conestoga River and held my hands out and went spread eagle and and tried to stop it, there's no way I could stop it. 
And that's what God's love is towards us. And what we're being taught here is that we are meant to have this relentless flow of goodness that flows from us to other people. And these are the five things that Paul mentions. Kindness is just simply being good to other people. Let me take action. Let me care for you in some way. It's proactive. Gentleness is is a kind of meekness. It's a little bit like humility, but it's a posture that I'm going to have to you, towards you. I mean, why is it that it's so easy for us to cross our arms and, and when we think of some person who's offended us in some way, and the flow stops? And we think we are justified to no longer be gentle towards you or meek towards you. We've risen up in pride, we've passed judgment, and we've said, that's where it stops for me. Nothing more for you. Patience here means long-suffering. Some of your versions might say that. literally means long anger. And how many of us have had relational troubles because we have short anger? And you don't actually have to do much or say much to me, but I am done with you. But to literally bear up under this for a long, long time. That's what we need to do. That's the only way... And here's the thing about these, especially as we get into these last three. One of the things that Paul's teaching us here, and we need to see this about ourselves: the only way you can have a healthy, long-term relationship with another human being like you is to do this. Like when he says, you need to bear with each other, what does he mean when he says that? What he means is, and I don't know how we all kind of personalize this, we all read this and, and we think about everyone else. And we don't think about the fact that everyone else has to bear with me, right? Isn't that what we do when we read this? Yeah, I guess I I can think of a lot of people that I need to bear with. But when Paul says bear with one another, what he's alerting us to is the fact that as human beings, someone said it this way, we're all like porcupines. And the closer we we get together, the more more we poke each other. And that is so true, isn't it? We all have things about us that cause frustration. Are you married? Have you figured this out yet? (laughs) Ask your spouse. Someone said, I didn't realize realize what I was like until I got married. My spouse told me. (laughs) The only way to have long-term relationships with other believers is to learn to bear with. And yes, I've got to bear with you, but, but turn it around. One of the most important things for me to realize as as a Christian has been, oh, I didn't really want to believe this, but I annoy people. I do. And I know there's people sitting here, and you're not nodding, and you're not saying amen, but I know you are in your heart. (laughs) That's the reality of being human. So we got to be patient with you. I need you. Can I just, let me just say it. I need you to be patient with me. Sometimes I preach too long, and sometimes I don't reach out with an email when I should have, and sometimes I say the wrong thing in the foyer. I know that. I'm not doing it on purpose, but I need you to bear with me, just as I might need to bear with you. We need to forgive. We're going to do a whole Sunday on this. If you've read much of the New Testament, you know this, and this is actually shocking and astounding, But here's what Jesus taught. If you don't forgive, you are not forgiven. That's the teaching of Jesus. You don't forgive, he's essentially saying this, you're not saved. That's an amazing statement. It's several times in the New Testament. And what Jesus is saying and what Scripture is saying is, if you can't forgive another sinner, you being a sinner can't forgive another sinner, then you don't yet understand the gospel of God's grace. So forgive. This is our behavior. We choose these things. They flow from within, from the reality that God is transforming us. They flow from our identity, the reality of who we are in Christ. Look again at that phrase in verse 13, and I'll put it on the screen here for you. Here's the teaching of Paul. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. This is why the gospel is so important. It's important for us to hear and know the gospel so we can be saved. 
But the gospel's important because you can't live the Christian life unless you live in celebration moment by moment of this reality of what God has done for you. You can't relate properly to other people unless you live in celebration of what God has done, how God has related to you in spite of you. And it's amazing truth, right? So if we think, oh, it's so hard to forgive someone who sinned against me, what was it like for a holy God to forgive an unworthy sinner like you and in fact to actually have to come to earth, take human form, and die a cruel death so that he could forgive you? Can we forgive others because in light of what God has done for us, we can. And how often the New Testament goes back to Christ, goes back to the cross again and again, goes back to the gospel and says, love one another, Jesus says, as I have loved you. Or in Romans where it says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. Let the gospel be your guide. Let the good news of Jesus be your banner. The thing that motivates you and gives you encouragement to, to love one another the way that God has loved you. I've been encouraged in spite of this hard four or five weeks that we've had to see the reality of, as Shannon said, the church being the church. And I just want to see this grow. I want us to see, I want to see us be a church of relational resilience. I want to see us be a church where we don't give up on each other. We don't go home on Sunday and gossip about other people in the church. We don't withhold forgiveness. We don't hang on to bitterness. We love one another because we've been commanded to and in Christ we are enabled to love as Jesus loved. We're going to sing a closing song to encourage us in this and then I will come and close in prayer. Amen. Quick note to the young adults. Uh, lunch it's going to start at around 12.30, so I know you're here now. Come on back if you can. We'd love to have you. We hope you'll, you'll join us. As we close, how are you doing in your relational resilience? Are there any relationships here in this church, bruised, broken, needing reconciliation? What is God saying to you? Are you a kind person? Is there a flow from your heart of compassion towards the people around you? How are you at receiving others in spite of the hurt they perhaps have caused you? Are you patient, forgiving, bearing with them? This is what God calls us to as his people. And Lord, we do this because you've asked us to, but only, Lord, by the power that you supply. It's only possible for us because of what Jesus has done. And Lord, we want to look to the cross and be amazed again at the grace of Christ, that he would lay down his life to save and forgive such unworthy people like us. And I pray that we could extend that same grace and kindness to one another, Lord. Build our relationships. Make them strong. May they bring you glory and honor. May they be a testimony of gospel witness to the people who see the way that we love others. We ask that you do this here in this church, in this place. And we pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God go with you this week.